You too, Sean. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day to all of you. It's a, a coincidence, I suppose, uh, that Mother's Day fell on the end of our series on sacrifices. Um, which is maybe apt, maybe not. Um, I know from my experience, my mom was a, a pillar of sacrifices. Uh, being able to see how she lived her life in sacrifice for us. Uh, my sister and myself and the many things that she did to make sure that we would be cared for and loved for and, 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 and put in a position to succeed. But it's a different kind of sacrifice that we're talking because the sacrifice that a parent shows their child is a sacrifice coming from a place of power to humble themselves to bring up those who are lower. But the sacrifices that we're called for is definitely not from a place of power. Because God's in that place of power. God made that sacrifice for us. The sacrifices we as his followers do is a different kind of sacrifice. But, again, with my mom, she was a great illustration of that as well. Living in sacrifice to her God, her Savior. Living out her life in a way that was for his kingdom. And that's what we're going to continue to look at today as we kind of wrap up this probably all too short look at sacrifice in our worship and the standard of sacrifice in our Christian faith. A couple weeks ago when we started, we looked at the commands to worship God through sacrifices. We looked at some of those Levitical laws that were, were set into place. That God had such a great desire to transform how we as His people viewed and interact with the, interacted with the world that we lived in. And that's part of the reason that he instituted that practice of sacrifice. And how those sacrifices were not the end game to worship him. But rather were an imperfect prequel. A prequel to which God would bring through his true plan. The plan of his son who would sacrifice himself for all of us. We talked about how Jesus... And his sacrifice wasn't just an inflection point by which the old law ended, but was rather a place, a perfect moment in which the old law found its completion. Because that was the end game all along. No longer was there a need for sacrifices as we find in the Old Testament to remind us, his people, of our sins and our failures as we continue to strive to live in His kingdom in the way that He wanted to. We don't need that anymore because the perfect high priest presented that perfect offering to pay off all of the debt. Perfectly. Today, today we're going to look at or try to figure out what we're supposed to do with all of because if God instituted sacrifice so that we would better understand the sacrifice Christ would one day make, well, what's required of us now? Now that that debt has been fully paid. A couple weeks ago, we looked uh, a little bit more deeply at some of these scriptures here above me where it talks about how God does not desire sacrifice. And Kathy mentioned that a few times during our Bible class this morning, that, that God does not desire sacrifice. The sacrifices, He desires our hearts. He desires us to desire to obey Him. To live in His will. God cares less, again, about those sacrifices than the heart behind it. That He doesn't desire, He doesn't hunger for meat, He doesn't care about whether or not this is burned up for Him or not. It was the heart behind it that mattered. He doesn't want us to feel hardships. That's not His goal. Just to hurt, to be willing to hurt for the sake of God. He wants us to pursue Him. So if that's the case, and again, if you look at these, only one of those, and this is, granted, this is not an exhaustive list of all of the times that, that it speaks to this idea that God does not desire sacrifice. But if you look at this pretty well-made list, only one of those is in the New Testament. Most of that occurred deep within the heart of when sacrifice was the act of worship of God. But now that we're in the New Testament, now, now, now that we are a New Testament church with a new covenant, does that mean that there's no need for sacrifice anymore? That Christ's sacrifice, since it was the end all, it was the be all, it was that blank check for all who desired it, does that mean that following or, or, or accepting it means that there's no strings attached? 
Well, long story short, no. We do have a responsibility. We are offered salvation. We are offered forgiveness. We are offered a new home, a new life, a new family, and a new purpose. But it requires that we put our faith in Him. That we put our faith in the One who is offering us salvation. John 3.16 says that we need to believe in Him to receive it. So that He can save us. We must trust in Him, as it says in Galatians 2.16. And that we must trust that He will save us. And in John 14, 15 through 31, it talks about the need to obey Him. To obey the One in celebration because He has already saved us. To borrow a concept from the not-so-recent movie Hitch, God has gone 90%. He's taken most of the effort away from us. He has done most of the job. He has come in to be in relationship with us. All He requires is us to do the 10%. God done the 90. In fact, he's probably done the 99.999. He just requires us to take that last 0.0001%. To accept that love, to celebrate that love, and to share that love with those that we meet. So in this new age of sacrifice, what is it? What is this new age of sacrifice? Galatians 2, 20 through 21 talks about how we must die to ourselves. We must die to ourselves in the old life that we had so that we can live a new life through Him. And we need that new life because we can't gain forgiveness on our own. Romans 12, 1 calls us to be a living sacrifice, presenting our bodies as an instrument of worship constantly. Matthew 16, 24 through 27, again, talks about the need to deny yourself, to deny what you want and what you want to do, to pick up your cross and to follow. In Galatians 3, 28, Paul tells us that we need to even throw away all the things that used to define us before. That it doesn't matter what our faith was before, it doesn't matter what our heritage was before, it doesn't matter our socioeconomic status before, None of that matters. All that matters is that we are now, now in Christ, so that we must give up all of those other things. Christ alone matters. Christ is your identity. That we sacrifice ourself, again, in the grand scheme of things, is 0.0091% or whatever made up percentage we want to go with. Denying ourselves, giving that up for the sake of following the one who gave 99.999%. But in the moment, we talked about this in our class downstairs, in the moment when we live in our life, that 0.001% or whatever feels like 110%. Because our whole lives is in our whole self. We experience the world between our two ears, and it's hard to give up that self-sovereignty that we are in control. But we need to. We have to. So what isn't a sacrifice? What isn't that sacrifice that we're called to give now that we are following Jesus? What isn't it? Well, it's not ritual and it's not traditional practices. That's not sacrifice. In Hebrews 13, 1 through 16, the Hebrew writer teaches us, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God our sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips that openly profess His name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Our sacrifice of praise should be constant. It should be the constant in our life. Everything that we do, everything that we say, should be pointed to Jesus. But somehow over time, this idea of a sacrifice of praise got distorted a little bit. It shifted to being a literal sacrifice to God that, that our worship, that when we come to church to worship, that was our sacrifice of praise. That taking part in corporate worships, worship, worship Tick the box of that sacrificial obligation. 
that the sum of our time given up on Sundays and midweek meetings is all that God desired, that He just wanted us to give up some time. The time that we would rather be doing doing something else, watching a movie, exploring our hobbies, working, making money, spending time with our friends, the things that we would rather do, that God, He just wants us to give up some of that time, and that's, that shows our devotion to God, and that's what worship it. That's not what kind of sacrifice God wants. Just because time equals money doesn't mean that time sitting in the pew counts as time sacrificed. That's not what it's about. That, that the time that we give in the pews is that payment of time showing our dedication. That's not the sacrifice God's calling us to. That the time that we spend in church, whether it's on Sunday morning or during the week, that, that, that's re-upping our weekly contract with God. That's not the sacrifice God is talking about. Rituals and traditions implemented in these worship services isn't reestablishing that covenant with Jesus. But somehow I think it kind of got to be that way in our hearts and our minds. In the same way that back in, in the Old Testament as we read through the Old Law and the Old Prophets, we see how those sacrifices became the focus of their worship. That they had to continually go back to those sacrifices over and over again to reestablish their covenant with God. To re-remind themselves of their sinfulness and their desire to get out of it. Somehow over time, our obedience to God and that sacrifice became just not forsaking the assembly. In Acts and into the epistles, we can see how central the role of, of communion, of the Lord's Supper was to that first century church. That it was a big deal. But somehow I think that that also got twisted into something that it was never meant to be. I was born and raised in the Church of Christ. I can't count how many churches that I've worshipped in or how many different congregations that I've taken the Lord's Supper with. I can't, I can't even comprehend it. But I can count how many were my, that I considered a home, a home church on one hand. And even though all of these churches were very different in a lot of different ways, there were some things or most things that were very similar. And one of those interesting things was about the Lord's Supper. Now, again, communion, the act of coming together as a body to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is absolutely pivotal to our worship. It's central to the gospel. But in almost every single church that I can think of, especially those that I considered a home, how many times did I see people, as soon as communion was done, as soon as, as separate and apart, the offering was taken up, a not insignificant portion left? And how many of those congregations in, in the evening, in Sunday evening, for those that, that didn't come in to worship in the, in the morning, that, that we had a Lord's Supper for them, separate and apart in a different room so that they could take communion somewhere else. Almost every single one of them. Those acts were, were coming from a good place because, yes, communion is important. But it's not about eating a cracker and drinking juice. That's not the point of communion. The point of the Lord's Supper, the point of communion is communing as a body, remembering as a body the sacrifice that was made for us and celebrating it together. I could not understand why so, like, so many people would just leave because that was the important part. They had technically not forsaken the assembly. They had had a communal snack. And they thought that that was enough, that that constituted as their sacrifice of praise. Where did it come from? That's not taught anywhere. It's not written on a poster anywhere that, hey, as long as you do these things, you're good. But somehow, it became commonplace. First day of the week, check, I'm here. First, don't forsake the assembly. I was here. I, people saw me. I, I took the Lord's Supper. 
But when it's boiled down to just technical attendance and that communal snack, it's not the same as a sacrifice of praise. Doing something out of begrudging obligation does not a sacrifice me. Worship isn't about suffering. And honestly, there was a time in my life where I kind of thought it was. I thought the Lord's Supper, if it was to be a true Lord's Supper, I couldn't enjoy the taste of the cracker. Some, I mean, that's nonsense, kid. Like, I don't know where my brain got it. But we tie sacrifice to suffering so often that we feel like a sacrifice isn't a sacrifice unless we're hurting. And then if that's the case, then chances are our sacrifice isn't out of joy. It's not out of choice. It's out of obligation. And that's not the point. Sacrifice isn't about suffering. It's about transformation. Worship is choosing. Choosing to lower yourself, forsaking yourself, giving up that idea of self-sovereignty because God is God. You are recognizing his position, his place in the world, and you are declaring it to yourself and to all around you. You are denying yourself, sacrificing yourself, following Christ and choosing to be a living sacrifice. And that's by recognizing how little of a sacrifice that really is. Recognizing that, that, that not pursuing my pleasures and my joys and, and maybe my dreams for the, sake of something, for, for the sake of Christ is absolutely worth it because God is God. It's not about, I guess I'm going to have to go and do nice things now. That's not sacrifice. Well, I, I, you know, I, I want to come with you, but I got church on Sunday, so, you know, sorry. That's not sacrifice. It's about being transformed. Being transformed by the love and the grace of Jesus. No longer bound by the rules and the value systems or restrictions of the world. But holding a new point of view. God's point of view. Using our heavenly eyes to see the spiritual world that we live in. And realize that my physical joys, my pursuit of wealth, mean nothing compared to God's kingdom. And to happily give that up in pursuit of what God wants. To place Christ as the center of our life rather than ourselves. And these sacrifices shouldn't be done sullenly. It shouldn't be done under protest, but rather filled with joy. Which is often one of the hardest things, to be perfectly honest. It's hard. But we should be thankful Thankful that we have the ability and the opportunity to give. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 calls us to give cheerfully and joyfully, not out of obligation. Matthew 10, 39 talks about finding true life by losing our own, by giving up our own lives. That the only way that we can truly find life is by giving up ourselves. In Acts 20, 35 that is more blessed to give than to receive. We can say that. We can know it in our heads, but to feel it in our hearts is something completely different. Each week we have the kids come up and give to a, a particular cause that we've, we've decided as a congregation to support, which is Hav um, in Rwanda, and help him to have a better life. And we see the joy in the, of the kids running up to give, and we laugh, and I'm, oh, I, I was for sure that this base was going to break today. Kaiji had Sora in a headlock at one point. I was about to flip out. <laughs> but the joy that they give, but again, they give with that joy because that money came from my car. Right? But that's the mentality that we should have because the money that's in my pocket came from God. Do we believe that? Or do we still hold on to the fact that, well, I earned this money. I worked hard for this money. I've saved a long time for this money. Are we willing to give it the same way those kids gave my money away? That's hard. 
We sacrifice to celebrate our new identity in Christ by seeking out ways to leverage the things that God has given us for His kingdom rather than my own. God has blessed us all in a lot of different ways. I look out in this congregation and I, I, see, I see amazing abilities. I see incredible intellect. I see incredible hearts for love and service. And a lot of those, if not all of those, could be somehow leveraged for your own benefit. In a lot of ways, that's kind of what growing up is. You go to school, you kind of figure out what you're good at, what you're passionate about. You try to like put those together and find a career so you can support yourself. But are you willing to sacrifice some of those for God's kingdom? to use the gifts that God gave you for His kingdom? Are you just willing to give what's left over? That's hard. Because denying yourself means pursuing the will of another. That's what self-sacrifice is. Taking myself out of the center, putting Christ there, and then serving that. Serving Him with all of the strengths God gave me. All of the weaknesses God gave me. All of the passions God gave me. And even some of the fears God gave me. Can I sacrifice and give those over to His will? Am I willing to or am I holding them for myself? Sacrificing our time and our talents. Sacrificing our resources. Sacrificing our personal desires and ambitions. All of those are ways that we can sacrifice and we're called to sacrifice to give those over for His good purpose. Not to earn it. Don't twist my words. You could give up all of your money. You could empty your retirement account. Uh, You could give it all to me, uh, to the church, to Hav, to Eastern European missions. That's not going to get you into heaven. The act of that sacrifice is not but the heart behind it could be because it's in celebration of what God already gave us. In celebration of the sacrifice God already made for you. So what are you ready to give over to the purpose of God's kingdom? That's a question I need you to think right now. We're closing out the sacrifice series. We're moving on to forgiveness next week. So what are you willing to give over for the purpose of God's kingdom. Now, what are you not willing to give? What's holding you back? What do you want to hold on to and just give God the extra? Because we need to identify what those are and we need to make some real decisions because if Christ is truly the Son of God, the Messiah, are we acting like we believe it? Through Jesus, God did the lion's share of the work. Again, He just left us that 10%, that .0001%. And that's not always easy to do. To be a follower of Jesus, you must deny yourself. You must take up your cross. You must follow Him. And that's going to look different for all of us. Every single one of us. Maybe it's a kind of sacrifice that you need to give up because there's something holding you back. Maybe there's a a hobby, an activity, a habit that you are holding too strongly to and it is keeping you from serving in God's kingdom. Maybe you need to sacrifice that. Maybe that's the self you need to give up. Maybe it's a dream or plan that you have in the future that you need to let go of and instead pivot to pursue God's plan for you. Maybe it's a talent or a passion that God deeply rooted inside your heart that you need to, instead of thinking of how you can turn it into a career or turning it into your own success, that you can use that specifically for God's will. An intentional decision to do that. Maybe it's that. To leverage it for God's kingdom rather than your personal enjoyment or success. God has created us all in His image, each one of us. We have strengths, we have weaknesses, we have passions, we have abilities, we have fears. Are you willing to give up all of those for the sake of God's kingdom? 
or are you too focused on trying to spend them on your own plans and desires? God has invited us into a relationship with him. And again, I don't know why he did it. I think it was a poor choice on his part, but I'm so thankful that he did. He has chosen to seek us out. He has bought us with the blood of his son. He set before us the purpose of sharing the gospel, even though we are imperfect reflections of Jesus. He still said, no, you, I've got a plan for you. You're going to be my ambassador here on earth. You're going to share the message of Jesus with the people around you, and you are going to shine like a city on the hill. God did all of that work, and now it's our responsibility to accept it, to accept his love, to dedicate our lives to trying to reciprocate that love, even though we know we can never fully give back the wealth that he had given to us, and to give our all in sharing that love with those around us. We've got to hold nothing back. That was the purpose of the sacrifices that we saw in the Old Testament. You see that it's not, it's not just calling for a sacrifice. It's always calling for the cleanest, the firstborn, the best, the first fruits, that which is most valuable to the people. God said, give that to me first. And it wasn't because, again, he wanted us to hurt. He didn't want us to suffer to show our dedication through our suffering. He wanted us to transform our minds to value him more. That's what sacrifice is about. So that we can share in His love by loving God truly with all of our mind, all of our whole heart, all of our soul, and all of our strength. Putting everything about who we are into pursuing love of God. To seek and make each moment a joyful sacrifice of praise. To make our lives one that makes every effort to turn every blessing that God has given us into support of His kingdom. To joyfully seek out opportunities to sacrifice our lives for the service of His kingdom. And placing our strength, our weaknesses, our fears and our passions on an altar before God. To serve Him. Handing them all over to His service. Again, not trying to earn His love, but to celebrate. So as we go through this week, you need to ask yourself that question. What are you holding back? Are you ready to give it all? For the most part, intellectually, we know that we should give it all. It's that first step that's often the hardest. Sometimes it's hard to even figure out what that step's supposed to be. What does that step look like in my life? Sometimes we're too scared to even look for that step. But the time is now to do it. There's no reason to dawdle, as my mom would say. No need to dilly-dally around. It's time to do it now, today. If you are ready to take that step, let's do that together today. If you don't know how to do that, come find me. I'm struggling too. Let's figure it out together. You don't have to do it alone. That's why we're here as a church. It's not just because it sounds better when we sing together. It's so that we can stand together and walk together towards God's good kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for all that you've given to us. All of the many steps that you've made to bring us back into holy relationship with you. We thank you for your sacrifice that, that paid all of our debt. The debt of death and sin you took on and you cleared our ledger. And so God, let us celebrate that by, by seeking out ways to show you our love by obeying you. By showing your love to those around us. By not trying to keep it to ourselves or, or hide it from, from those that we spend time with because we're a little afraid of the awkward conversations that might come out of it, but let us boldly share your love, even when that love's not reciprocated. Let us reflect your love in that way, by choosing to love first, to serve first, and to hold nothing back. 
Inspire us. Open our eyes to opportunities that we have, both big and small. Help us to find new and interesting ways to bring your gospel to people. Give us a spirit that seeks you out intentionally and seeks to serve and worship